Hey everybody, this is Ben and Alex. Welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. What are you supposed to do when you know you're in a historical moment? So many Americans are just operating in a different reality. There are a lot of built-in incentives, whether it's our electoral system or even how our media works, that incentivizes partisanship and that incentivizes sensationalism. I see that as a public good, the opinion that's how can we make progress on this issue? Where do we stand on this issue? And how can we move the state forward? All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in to another episode. Today, we have Kevin Frazier for you. And Kevin Frazier is the founder of The Oregon Way, which is an opinion page that allows uh, people from tons of different voices from across Oregon, basically, to voice serious public policy opinion on a number of different issues. He's also a law student at Berkeley, and he also has his uh, master's from Harvard University. So Kevin's clearly a, a pretty successful guy. And of course, he is an alumni of the Wayne Moore Scholars Program, which your hosts, both of us truly, we're also so, uh, and Kevin's also involved in a number of uh, community nonprofit organizations, both across Oregon and in California. So Kevin is really the big uh, community guy about bringing people together, about having a serious discussion of ideas. Uh, and that's why we thought he would be good to come on the show. Yeah, Kevin. Kevin's an interesting, interesting guy for a few reasons. Um, the first is kind of how he fits into the political spectrum. Um, amidst the polarization and, and nationalization of politics that that Alex and I talk about on this podcast. Um, so he identifies as a moderate, and that's sort of the the orientation of the the Oregon Way um, substack that he's created is sort of like this problem solving philosophy. And he often will cite like he cites Norma Paulus and he cites Dave Fronmeyer and Mark Hatfield and Tom McCall. And there's this long list of um, left of center or moderate Republicans who used to be the standard bearers in Oregon and who were central in a lot of the political and policy reforms that put Oregon on the map, you know, the beach bill, the bottle bill, um, you know, Senator Wayne Morris, for whom the Wayne Morris Center is named after is another one who started as a moderate Republican um, or progressive Republican. And the Oregon way is sort of talking about how we can rebuild that political culture or, or reestablish it. And it's interesting because it's, it's sort of the opposite of the thesis that Alex and I have about what Oregon's future is going to look like. And in our opinion, the nationalization and polarization of politics that we see is at least in the short term irreversible. Um, and you're not going to see the political figures of today's Oregon Republican party embrace the sort of moderate positions that were necessary for the crossover bipartisanship that we saw in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in Oregon. So Alex, I don't know, you're, you're a Republican in Oregon. Um, what did you think about the, the Oregon Way's thesis? Yeah, I mean, I just think that uh, one, our thesis basically uh, totally disagrees with the Oregon Way. Uh, I'm not really sure if there is an Oregon Way anymore in the sense that there is various, you know, a long list of policies that both Republicans and Democrats could get behind. And I think a good example of that is Mayor Ted Wheeler, right? I mean, he's seen as a moderate. Uh, he's definitely a moderate Democrat, at least from the Oregon standard. He's a former Republican, but you know, he'll say things basically that a lot of our institutions are built on white supremacy. Uh, I don't know if you could find really any card carrying member of the Oregon Republican Party that would agree with a statement like that. But of course, you have a lot of folks on the left too, who are particularly upset at what Ted Wheeler has been doing with Portland, how he's been handling the protest, how he stood up to Donald Trump and things like that. You know, there you go. There's another national issue. The mayor of Portland standing up to the president. Uh, so I just don't really know with the nationalization of politics, if the so-called Oregon way is at least possible at this point. So yeah, I think what Kevin is doing is, is certainly interesting. And I think that it is good to bring people together and try to work through these different issues that, you know, may be able to have a positive impact on us all. But I mean, I mean, Ben, what do you think is the long-term uh, basically viability of, of the Oregon Way project? Like, do you think that that's something we can come back to productively? Maybe now that President Trump is in an office, do you think the nationalization of politics is really here to stay? So it's it's a worthy project, but it probably won't have too much impact. I'm just curious of, obviously, Oregon is mostly controlled by Democrats right now. I mean, what do you think, what do you think the progressives or the Democrats in the state house, what, what is their response to the Oregon Way? Well, I mean, we can take uh, um, our first guest, Representative Winsway Campos, as an example. The the sort of Oregon way bipartisanship, I think, would um, would not be something that she would be in favor of. I mean, she talked about creating a 
um, progressive caucus and a progressive PAC basically to counter the um, desire to sort of compromise on democratic core values in the in the name of bipartisanship. So yeah, I, I, do, I don't know. What's interesting, what I think folks should listen for in this episode is when we start talking about the, the small d democratic reforms that Kevin is talking about, like open primaries, ranked choice voting, those kinds of things that would shift the incentive structure of politicians to try to appeal more towards the center rather than towards the base. Um, do those have a chance of passing in Oregon? I don't know, maybe, probably not, but maybe. And if they do, is that enough to, are those reforms enough to um, kind of break up the national trends that we see in terms of polarization? So I think that was interesting. I th also thought we, we got into an interesting discussion at the end about what the future of media might look like. So in terms of the Oregon way, whether it'll look more like what the Oregon way thinks or what the Oregon bridge thinks, we will see shortly. But um, the project, the, the media project itself of the Substack, which is basically like a statewide op-ed page for um, political figures to contribute to, I think it's a, a brilliant idea. And I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's only going to see growth over the next few years. Yeah, and I think it, it's funny too because uh, you know we obviously have the Oregonian, which is the flagship newspaper of 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 the state, and I feel like Kevin, who's just basically a twenty-something-year-old dude, uh, has gotten some pretty serious people to write for his publication. At least that I haven't seen in the Oregonian opinion sections in a long time. So I mean, you really do have, and I think that is uh, possibly the most interesting part of this podcast is the sort of disruption in media, what the new media looks like, because you have this guy who's a full-time law student, by the way, but he can still get some pretty big names to be able to contribute to what's basically a blog that he's running or paying, you know, $5 a month, basically, to put up. He doesn't have reporters. He doesn't have this huge production staff. Uh, I think that the revolution or the evolution, I guess you might want to call it, of media is definitely interesting. So make sure to take uh, note of that, folks. And we definitely would be interested in sort of your thoughts on what the future of, of media should look like uh, on the Oregon way. Definitely go and check it out, too. Kevin gives his contact information uh, at the end. So uh, thanks again for, for tuning in. Make sure to hit the subscribe button. Make sure to give us five stars uh, so we can continue to make these wonderful conversations for you all. Uh, and thanks again for listening. Thanks, everyone. All right, Kevin Frazier, welcome to the podcast. Um, and to start us off today, we wanted to ask you, you know, I know you're a political nerd, much like uh, Alex and I. Um, with this week or two weeks of craziness with capital insurrection slash coup slash riot um, and the start of the Oregon legislative session, um, what's been on your mind the last couple of weeks? What's, what have you been spending the most time thinking about? Yeah, well, uh, I guess I'll start off saying thanks for having me on the show. It's great to see both of you, even if over Zoom, and I will always take up the opportunity to talk about Oregon politics. So diving into that question, for me, I was actually on a walk earlier today and the question came up and we both were just thinking, what are you supposed to do when you know you're in a historical moment? And how do you even grapple with the fact that this is something that's going to be in textbooks, right? Like our kids are gonna be saying, what the heck was going on when those people stormed the Capitol? And for me, I just think it evidences how so many Americans are just operating in a different reality. And obviously some folks are in a crazier reality than others. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, I think that's a small minority of Americans. But even when you take just one step back, for me, this week has really shown how divided we all have become and how breaking that down is going to be quite the difficult task. So, so Kevin, I'm, I'm curious of what you mean. What, what exactly do you mean by different realities? Of course, there only is one reality. So, I mean, what, what, what do you mean by that? So the folks who storm the Capitol, I mean, thankfully, I haven't been studying their Twitter feeds or reading <laughs> any of their Reddit threads or wherever they're going these days. Uh, I guess not Twitter, but <laughs> <laughs> wherever they are Everyone going. Folks at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, clearly it's some spot where the election didn't go to Biden. And it's some spot where they have the right to be doing these protests and arguably the obligation to be launching these sorts of riots. And I think that's the reality that isn't borne out by anyone who's kind of grounded in the political reality of where we are today. And using that reality term, I guess I'm talking about folks like 
moderate Republicans, moderate Democrats, uh, folks across the aisle who have come out and said, hey, you know, these are the results. They've been certified. Let's move mm -hmm. on. And so I think to me, what stood out was having that sort of across the board fact challenged so vehemently was what showed the disparity in kind of realities. Interesting. So, so I'm curious because I know at least that that Cliff, that Cliff Benz, who's, you know, the new Republican congressman from, from Morgan too, uh, he actually had objected to certifying the election results. Now, I remember there was something specific here in terms of only in some folks were not in oh, only in Pennsylvania. Okay. So I know that at least for some Republican politicians, Pennsylvania was seen as the safe one. I, I don't really know why objecting to the results was different in Pennsylvania than with Arizona. I mean, you're objecting to them regardless. But anyway, I mean, I think a lot of people saw him come into office as basically the moderate. Well, I guess some people would say Newt Beeler was more moderate, but I mean, Cliff Bentz was supported by like the mainstream Republican partnership, like pretty moderate groups. And I mean, he, he objected to, you know, the certification of the election that Joe Biden had fairly won the presidency. So I'm curious when you, when you mean moderate, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a fair point. I'd say looking at some of the folks who were earlier to recognize the validity of the election. So your Mitt Romney's, for example, the folks who were saying, I'm going to look at the elect election results, uphold them and argue that they're verified. And so I don't think the folks parsing between which state to challenge were the folks I describe as moderate. I think Cliff, Representative Bentz, for better or worse, started getting into that DC ethos and somehow got lured away from what I think a moderate Republican would argue from Oregon if they truly were moderate, which certainly wouldn't be challenging Ohio or Pennsylvania or Florida, whichever state, you know, I think it would be a moderate Republican based off of the origins of something like mail-in voting in Oregon wouldn't be challenging the status of things like mail-in voting in other states. The it's idea that we had Norma Paulus back in the 80s advance mail-in voting. A true moderate Republican would be adhering to that, especially one from Oregon, and not saying, you know, this mechanism of making it easier to vote should be thwarted at the national level. It's, I so, think it's just pure political survivalism. Like, it's like, is Cliff Benz ever going to lose to a Democrat in that seat? I can't see, I, it's hard for me to see reality where that's true. Jamie McLeod Skinner gave it a hell of a run and still, um, you know, lost sizably to, to um, Congressman Walden. So like, if I'm Cliff Benz and all I care about is maintaining power on my seat and, and maintaining a position in DC, the only place for me to go is a loss from the right. And so I think it was an interesting, like, I think like voting to certify Arizona, but not Pennsylvania is was the like the attempt of because like a, a Trump Trump Republicans would not say they would say that that is a moderate position right you you only you only voted to certify one of the two contested states and so Benz had a rep reputation in the legislature of being like work across the aisle kind of guy very sensible and I think this mm -hmm. was just him trying to survive in a political environment that is bananas and unpredictable and where people on the right can go after you for not being sufficiently subservient to Mr. Trump. But anyway, we should talk about the Oregon Bridge, Titus. Yes. So, so Kevin, you, you said something earlier about Representative Benz I thought was interesting. You called it DC ethos in terms of he basically had adopted this position in DC uh, or sort of what the DC, I don't know if you want to call them the conservative establishment because there's obviously was a lot of disagreement amongst if people should object to the election results or not. But uh, Kevin, we know that you are the founder and the publisher of uh, The Oregon Way. So tell us, what exactly is The Oregon Way? What is this project that you're working on uh, and where does it stand right now? Yeah, thanks for teeing that up. I think this is perfectly related to the conversation we're having because as Ben pointed out, there are a lot of built-in incentives, whether it's our electoral system or even how our media works that incentivizes partisanship and that incentivizes in particular sensationalism on the media side. So politically, you know, folks are driven to avoid getting primaried, which is why you see behavior that tends to go to the extreme of whatever party you're a part of. In a media sense, 
we know that the articles that trend on Twitter, or I don't know what you say about things that trend on Parler, but whatever is doing well on Parler, it's well, not- Parler's shut down right now, so nothing's doing well on right. Parler. Right, okay, there we go, good point. So, you know, whatever is gonna gain traction on those sites isn't the nuanced take, isn't the, hey, let me break this down in a way that doesn't kind of appeal to your partisan animosity or ideological bent. And so the Oregon way is trying to create a space where folks can get that information, right? I see that as a public good, the opinion that's trying to not appeal to the left or the right, but just appeal to how can we make progress on this issue? Where do we stand on this issue? And how can we move the state forward? And the origin story of all of this actually came from our great alma mater, U of O, when I got to yeah. sit down with Dave Fraunmeyer on a couple of occasions. He was a Rhodes Scholar and I was attempting to be a Rhodes Scholar, only made it to the finalist round, but Dave and I were able to grab coffee as he tried to give me some advice. And from those conversations, which fortunately he maintained even after I lost, I learned a lot about this idea of the historical roots of this notion of an Oregon way, of a political culture where you could have folks like Mark Hatfield, Tom McCall, Dave Fraunmeyer's, Vera Katz on the Democratic side, and then eventually Kitzhopper as well. And these folks who were able to forge kind of a consensus. And so the Oregon way is trying to respond to all of these pressures to be more extremist and just create space for folks who don't want to go in either of those directions. So I want to talk about, um, there's the Oregon way, the publication, which, you know, I, I like the way you describe it. You're like kind of, you're creating a space for different ideas of, with nuance and um, complexity to exist together. And then there's the Oregon way, the sort of political ideology that maybe undergirds the publication or um, it's in the, in the book that you're publishing weekly on the Oregon way, you talk about, I think the, the, the short definition you use is the Oregon way is a pragmatic collaborative approach to achieving progressive political outcomes. And you cite Dave Fronmeyer, you, you cited Norma Paulus already in this conversation, obviously Mark Hatfield, um, Tom McCall, the sort of like moderate Republicans of, of yesteryear. Can you tell me a little bit more, like when you're thinking of the Oregon way as a political philosophy, how you think Oregon should get back to that or, or, or what role you think that political philosophy should play in Oregon's political landscape today? Yeah, so I think the best bill to look at in terms of what the Oregon way means is Senate Bill 100. And for folks who aren't super wonky or into land use, this was essentially Oregon's bill to make sure that not every Oregon city became California. It was our attempt to reduce sprawl and to make sure that there was density so that all of the parts of Oregon that we love would be preserved. And so when you look back at the voting history on Senate Bill 100, this was in the 70s, you see this crazy mix of folks all across the state, all across the political aisle, coming together in this weird coalition that wanted to advance this measure. And to me, that reflected this shared appreciation for Oregon's uniqueness. And that was kind of the bonding thread. And I know that sounds lofty and pretty idealistic, but really you did get this sense of folks were on the defensive for protecting Oregon. This was a time when Governor McCall had his favorite quip, visit but don't stay, right? right. right? Like keep the Californians out, let's make sure Oregon stays Oregon. But I think underneath this was this notion of, if we all love this place so much, what are we gonna do to protect it? And so for me, that brought up notions of like Theodore Roosevelt-esque conservation, right? It's not conservation as perhaps we know it today, but this idea of we need to pass this on to the next generation. And it was that willingness to look forward that really defined the Oregon way for me. So I think this is interesting because in some ways, the Oregon Way, your thesis with the Oregon Way and our thesis with the Oregon Bridge are aligned. And in other ways, I think they're in conflict. And I wanna explore the tension a little bit. Um, so in, in the Oregon Way, you've got these towering progressive Republicans 
who are completely non-existent today in in Oregon. Like you can't you can't point to a single elected Republican. I mean, we just talked about Congressman Bentz, who arguably was one of the closest and is uh, when he was in the legislature and is nowhere near it now. And so it seems to me that, you know, our thesis about the nationalization of politics has made returning to what the Oregon way looked like in the 60s and 70s impossible. And like if, if, if restoring the Oregon way is dependent upon a Republican party fundamentally shifting what it cares about, then isn't that a hopeless vision to begin with? So let me just grab the knife in my heart and uh, pull it out <laughs> after that after that fatal stab. No, um, I I think you're right that this is not going to be an easy project by any means. The idea that I can start a blog and this is going to change tomorrow, sure. like, you know, I already get the attacks of Kevin, wake up. It's 2020, not the early 2000s. People aren't starting <laughs> blogs anymore. Um, well, you're you're on Substack, now, which, is very, hot, which is very there, trendy. There that is go. not a blog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. My, my formal publication. Uh, now I can tell my parents I'm published all the time. And, you know, they, they get so happy. So, Ben, I, I totally agree that my hope for the restoration of the Oregon Way is contingent on finding ways to remove the nationalization of Oregon politics. And from conversations I know y'all are having and the conversation we're having right now, I'm a big advocate for structural changes like open primaries, ranked choice voting, other means that make it easier to be that one-off candidate that's super Oregon focused and maybe not that person who's trying to appeal to the national stage that can garner enough support and doesn't have to rely on things like support from the DNC or uh, the RNC. So one quick follow-up there, and then I want Titus to you to bring in the sort of uh, contemporary Republican perspective, um, even if we institute it, and I think you're right. So, or, so open primaries probably do what you want them to do. But if you, even if you had open primaries and ranked choice voting, don't you think that like the, the, the largest constituency of voters would still want someone who's going to stand up to Donald Trump for, for federal offices and for the governorship in our current political landscape? Like, don't you think the, the way that we sort of organize ourselves and not by political party, but just by how we see the world or which reality we experience. to your earlier point is so based upon how we respond to Donald Trump over the last four years. And, um, and not just Donald Trump, but Trumpism, you know, the awful immigration policies of the administration, you know, or, or on the other side, the, the populism of the administration, right? Like, like the rhetoric against corporations, the, like, so I, I wonder if, if, if you implement your democratic, small d democratic reforms, like is that s significant enough to overcome the power of our national politics? So my hope is that it adds some nuance to the conversation, right? Where there are different shades of, okay, so let's imagine we've got four out of five Oregon candidates, I'd imagine are going to, regardless of where you grab them, but let's say it's somewhere relatively purple, purple, like Bend, mm -hmm. where we know there's going to be some Republicans, some Democrats running for a race. I'd venture to guess that if five folks ran, four of them would be opposed to Trump. And you now though, if we have a system that even contemplates that even allows for five people to run in a meaningful way, there's a lot more nuance that can get added into that conversation where it's no longer just, are you the pro Trump or anti Trump candidate? Now I've got four choices that I know stand with me in opposing Trump. Okay, check that national box. Great. I can go to sleep at night knowing that I'm not supporting a Trumpy or whatever you want to call them. Now I've got four candidates where I actually have to dig deeper and say, okay, so this person says they're a Democrat. What does that mean in this context? This person's part of the Green Party. What does that mean for me? Maybe that's where I want to look at, where now I see that they're anti-Trump, but they have this whole other agenda that's appealing to me. So my hope is that it lets folks check that national box and then dig deeper into why they care about Oregon in particular. Do you think the impact could be the opposite though? Like, the, like if you've got one Republican and they like sort of secure the Republican votes and then you've got four Democrats like, don't you think it's possible that the most partisan and the most like firebrand and loudest, like, don't you think it's, they actually would probably have the inside track on beating 
the others or, or am I thinking about this wrong? So that's where the beauty of ranked choice voting comes in, right? Because if you're that person who's anti-Trump, then your first four votes are all for the people who are anti-Trump and that fifth person who's pro-Trump, they're that fifth vote. So they okay. basically don't stand a chance. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So Titus, Oregon way from a, from a Republican's perspective, who I'm sure does not self-identify as, uh, as a Tom McCall Republican. <laughs> No, and, and uh, Kevin, I think it's interesting because, uh, you know, I'm obviously very conservative. You're a Democrat. Is Technically, I, I, I will share have... that I am right now registered in California as no party preference. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll new, come new, back new, to that. News, yeah, we'll come back to that. And, and <laughs> new, news was made on the, on the podcast. <laughs> uh, so exclusive. I, I think the most exclusive. Yeah, I think, though, Kevin, what's most interesting is... Uh, what you're saying in terms of taking national issues out as a Republican in this state, which we're obviously a, a minority, I would love for that to happen, right? Because uh, one thing I thought was really interesting, which happened to a guy like Newt Bueller, who I thought was a very good candidate for governor. I mean, we had a number of disagreement on policy issues, but he, he raised a lot of money. He's a stand-up guy. I thought he ran a really professional campaign against Kate Brown. And the guy literally didn't support Donald Trump at all and didn't support Brett Kavanaugh when that whole debacle was basically happening in the U.S. Senate in 2018. Now, of course, the, the ads, if you watch them against Newt Bueller, even though Newt Bueller said so many bad things about Trump, where Newt Bueller, vote for Newt Bueller is a vote for Donald Trump. You know, Newt Bueller, he's just pretending like he's pro-choice. He's actually pro-life. And in a way, the Democrats are really able to use national politics to their advantage a lot in this state, right? Like if they can just continuously say, this Republican stands with Donald Trump, they're crazy. That appeals re really well to your, really well to the Democratic base and really well to those voters. And of course there is just more Democrats. And it's interesting too, because we had Alex Carlados uh, who ran against Peter DeFazio in an earlier episode. And he even told us he had to nationalize the race in the way because there just wasn't enough local support in the state of Oregon, basically, to be able to run an effective campaign if he wasn't able to do that. Obviously, Republicans are in a disadvantage that way. So I'm curious, I mean, do you think if we do implement the Oregon way that you're basically just, just you're helping the, the GOP in a way and you're disadvantaging the Democrats? So I, I, I like to think of it as helping the Oregon voter, <laughs> because really right now you're between a rock and a really place. And the really place is the state <laughs> of our current GOP, which is no as folks have discussed, there's really no option, good option right there, which I think is why Alec had to say, hey, folks out of town, invest in this race so that we can get an R. Folks in Oregon are saying, the second I see an R next to your name, I'm just going to disregard you. And so mm -hmm. what I hope is that this sort of process of restoring a true marketplace of ideas that isn't only built to allow Democrats to win every primary that's west of the Cascades and Republicans to win every primary east of the Cascades, all of a sudden voters would have an actual choice because there'd be more than two folks. They'd, for the folks on the west side of the Cascades, they wouldn't just look at the race and say, oh, you have an R, there's no way I'm gonna vote for you. Well, now let's say that two Republicans get in the race or even someone who's part of the Libertarian Party Maybe you wouldn't have even considered that person previously because you thought they'd play some spoiler effect and destroy the chances of who may be regarded as the more sensible candidate winning. And you'd undermine that and lead to some far right Republican winning. By using this sort of approach, by having open primaries, by having ranked choice voting, you can get the sort of nuanced take of a Republican or someone who's conservative leaning that might be able to grab some of the upwards of 40% of Oregonian voters who are independent or third party voters. So I, I think we need to zoom out a little bit. There's an episode of the West Wing. Um, I love the West Wing. I imagine both of you probably do too. I was I was waiting for a Ben Bowman West Wing reference. <laughs> so here it is. Point, so here it is. There, there's an episode called um, pr Proportional Response um, or something like that. And the like the line, for which the episode is named is where the president is in the situation room. He goes, what is the virtue of a proportional response? And he's talking about military conflict. Like if they bomb us, why do we have to do something small to match that? Why can't we blow them out of the water to you know, signal our strength? 
And I want to ask what the virtue of moderation is for me. So when I ran in uh, as a primary candidate for the state Senate, like I was running to the left of the incumbent, someone who I, I perceived as not representative of the district politically. On If on one side of the issue, you have someone who wants health care for everyone. On the other side, you don't. And you have one side that wants everyone to have universal employment and the other side that doesn't. And the other one side that wants everyone to have access to housing and the other side that doesn't. Why is it good to meet in the middle? Why is moderation, if you're someone who believes that these things are universal rights or that everyone should have access to, why provide a platform for folks who don't align on those values, which are probably the, the fundamental values driven issues of our time? Like, why not just say, no, we should do the right thing and push full speed ahead? Right. That's, uh, that's a great segue to me flashing a book as if I was promoting manifesto. this. The Centrist so, Manifesto. So this is a fantastic read. I'd recommend it to anyone. Uh, for folks who aren't watching the video, this is The Centrist Manifesto by Charles Whelan. Unfortunately, it's pre-Trump. So there's a lot missing <laughs> from this. But the upshot of that sort of thinking and the sort of thinking that I think we can come to is we don't have to find the Goldilocks zone for every issue. I'm not talking about saying that there's always some magical sweet spot between every issue. Instead, I'd say what Oregonians and voters in general deserve are folks who are willing, allowed to say, hey, I think Republicans have it right on this issue, right? And I think Democrats have it right on this issue. I'm going to build a menu of things that are diverse across the ideological spectrum, not necessarily splitting the baby on any of those issues. But let's say I'm a candidate who at once is supportive of things like immigration reform, right? So I guess that makes me a Democrat in one sense. But maybe I'm also in support of, I don't know, small business support and just want to make sure that there's more entrepreneurship in Oregon. But don't we already have those people? Like, isn't that Tobias Reed and Ted Wheeler and, you know, John Kitsar? Like, haven't, haven't the, the moderates in the party, even in a deep blue state, like, if you're talented and good and um, can navigate the system, should there be litmus tests of any kind, right? Like, let's say a Republican has really good ideas on small business, but they're pro-life or they're anti-gay. Like, for me... My response to that is like, well, you don't have a place in policy making. If you get a vote, if you get a vote on me not being allowed to be married or adopt a child, and you are sub against those things, then like, I will take your good small business idea if I think it's helpful, or I hope someone who's sort of from the center left will adopt that. But I don't want you having a voice in government to like oppress me or or suppress right. my rights. So I don't know. I, that that's where I'm getting caught up. So maybe this helps and let me know. My hope is that this is merely expanding the options. I'm not going to tell any Oregon voter what litmus tests they should set up because I think folks are free to set up whomever's. And I share your view that folks who want to oppress other people probably don't belong in politics. But right now, when you get to the general election, so I think this Secretary of State's race is a fantastic example. Under a closed primary system, right? We had some fantastic candidates on the Democratic side. You look at Mark Hass, you look at Cameron Smith, you look at Jamie McLeod Skinner, and obviously the winner, Shamia Fagan. We had folks on the right. We had Kim Thatcher, and potentially under a different system, we could have seen someone like Rich Vile come out, right? So let's imagine all of those candidates run mm -hmm. in an open primary. Seven, vote, seven candidates across the political spectrum now Every Oregon registered voter has a say in who makes it to the general instead of a process in which arguably a very select few were able to make sure that Shamia advanced to the Democratic or through the Democratic primary onto the general. Now I'm an Oregonian voter, someone who doesn't, uh, who's not a Democrat, someone else decided who's going to be in the general and the Republican who I also didn't decide on, let's say I'm an independent. I've got two choices. That sucks. When's the last time you went anywhere and we're like, yeah, I'd only like two choices. Okay, thanks. <laughs> no, we don't live in that era. We don't live in binary, like you have to take A or B. We deserve way better than that. 
So we don't, we don't cuss on this podcast. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, oh, <laughs> my bad. Oh, um, no, but really, I'd say if why not give people the opportunity to cons- to apply their litmus tests? If you want to apply them to all seven, then fine. But I'd rather have you exposed to seven choices who you can think deeply about than be constrained to having two picks at the end of a process. Titus, what's so, to you as a Republican? Well, well, so so I actually think Kevin, this is this is a good transition point, and something I'm I'm definitely curious of to, to hear from you is Ben and I basically we you know we we did our homework and uh, we want to basically talk to you about where you see yourself fitting in on the political spectrum because one of the main things you frequently address through your writing is basically what we would describe as a call to moderation, and I think that in a way, sort of your call to moderation on some issues is how you frame what the Oregon way is. So I'm curious of where do you see yourself on the political spectrum? Like, are you a progressive? Are you a moderate? Are you fiscally, li- are you fiscally, you know, conservative, socially liberal? Uh, where, where is Kevin Frazier at, right? I mean, you just said you're in the state of California. They have one of the most progressive democratic parties in the country. You're not affiliated with them. I mean, we know you're affiliated with Democrats, at least in Oregon. Uh, where, where are you at? Where are you at on the spectrum? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm confused. I, <laughs> I don't know where that puts me on the political spectrum. Right now, my focus is really on the fact that the system we have just doesn't allow for broad views and for nuanced views and folks who flip-flop are denigrated rather than given the space to think about an issue, change their mind, and then pursue that issue. And what's driving me is that I think our system will be a heck of a lot better if folks are given the freedom to change positions and to embrace a lot of different ideas over time. So for me, it's difficult because I don't wake up every morning saying, I agree with everything Nancy Pelosi said. (laughs) <laughs> and I don't wake up every morning saying, gosh, Mitch McConnell, he's my guy. Like that hasn't happened either. And in Oregon politics, I grapple with not agreeing with everything the Democrats are doing. First and foremost, on these structural issues, I think parties have to get behind open primaries and rank choice voting. We shouldn't have a duopoly as our marketplace of ideas. So so much of my energy. Also, oh, so though, Kevin, I, I, I want to push back on that a little bit. And I think actually the, the GOP has been a good example of this in the state of Oregon, right? We have someone like Dennis Richardson, who ran for governor, came pretty darn close. I think most people would describe him as a pretty solid conservative. Of course, ran thereafter, was able to win a statewide election, right? Like conservative Dennis Richardson. By no means do I think Oregon as a whole is a conservative state, but like he was still basically able to craft sort of an interesting pitch, I think, that appealed to a number of voters to basically be able to, to win that election in 2016. Now, we have him sort of on that spectrum, right? Then we have someone like Newt Bueller, right, who was the total opposite. Like, I forgot exactly when he gave the interview, but he gave an interview basically calling for, like, the Republican version of Medicare for all. He was very outside of conservative orthodoxy on some of the LGBTQ issues, I think. He was avidly pro-choice. And of course, he was able to win the primary, pretty easily. And again, I, I, he came pretty far away, actually, from beating Kate Brown. I still think he ran a, a pretty respectable race, and I hope that he'll stay involved in Republican politics in the future. But I think that kind of, you know, is, is kind of a counterpoint to you in a sense, right? Of like, we had Dennis Richardson way over here, and we had Newt Bueller who was over here, and they were both able to be relatively successful in the Republican Party. Well, Titus, let me, let me, I was actually just thinking and writing this down as you were talking. In the, in the Democratic Party, you had Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, which offered a very stark choice. And then in the 2016 Republican primary, you had what was essentially an open primary. You had every flavor of Republican and Donald Trump, and it created conditions similar. You didn't have ranked choice voting, right, which may have that may have been the structural reform that would have mattered. But in terms of like voters having a choice, it seems like, you know, even in the Secretary of State's race, like anyone could have registered to become a Democrat and to join the the party to like have their voice heard. So I wonder, like, there's something happening in our politics that you've identified in the Oregon way about polarization, about what Dave Fronmeyer, one of your mentors called new tribalism. But I, I don't think choice actually solves it. When you actually, when you look at the, the evidence, choice has been present for throughout the last 
you know, since the Tea Party wave, which I, I kind of signal as the beginning of this, like voters have had plenty of choices. They've just oftentimes made the wrong ones. So I'm going to I'm going to disagree there because I think for Democrats or for registered Republicans, yes, there have been choices for the increasing number of Oregonians who don't identify with either party. There's continued to be no choice. So it's always been who other people select, who the Democrats selected and who the Republicans selected. And so if we actually gave a voice to the 40% of Oregonians who are in some version of the middle or just not identifying with either party, I think you could see drastically different outcomes. In fact, I think Mark Haas would be our secretary of state. So imagine a world in which Mark Haas doesn't lose in the Democratic primary because of the spoiler, he can still go on to the general, right? And he's not, there's no sore loser law, right? So right now, Haas lost a really close Democratic primary. I mean, razor thin. Mm -hmm. so he was winning, winning on election night and then losing when the race was called. Exactly. If the, Don the Donald Trump effect in, in Oregon. Yeah. No, no Oregon voter who didn't identify as a Democrat had a choice in whether a Mark Hass got to be their secretary of state. So I, I think there are choices within the party structures, and that may matter for more partisan folks, but for everyone else, there really aren't good choices. Hmm. It's an, inter it's an interesting thesis, and I like, I, I still... I think there's a lot to consider when you're thinking, I think ranked choice voting makes a ton of sense. I think the, the open primaries issue, like what the, what the Democratic Party sort of establishment, and you know, I've held, I was vice chair of the LGBT caucus of the DPO. I know you've held positions in the Democratic Party. Like I don't see the Democratic Party as being, you, you did have an interesting piece about how the California Democratic Party was like super inaccessible and it was very like insidery and top down. So that's interesting. I haven't ever had that experience in Oregon. It feels like if you just show up and care and do work, um, like it's pretty easy to get positions. Like the what what people from the Democratic Party will say is, we're a big tent party. Anyone can join our party if you align with our values and beliefs. But if you don't, and you don't wanna join our party, you shouldn't get to decide who we nominate. You should start your own political party and your own movement, which is what the Independent Party of Oregon has done. And kind of, I think the IPO folks might align with your thinking about the system and if tr their solution was creating a separate party, which is a, a longer longer topic, but hasn't moved the dial, I think you would probably agree, um, or maybe has in small ways, but not big structural ways. So what's the response about the political, the Democratic Party is a political party for its members and its members are choosing who to nominate. So if you're not a member, you shouldn't choose who that party nominates. So uh, I'm going to look for some support for, from Alex on this one, where I don't think any institution, any party, any organization should be gatekeepers to democratic participation. So right now we have 40% of Oregon's registered voters being locked out from having any say in who moves on to the general. But so they, could, some, they could register as Democrats if they want. Right, but I, I don't think you should, I don't think the state should compel you essentially to register a certain way just so you have to say, to have a say in your democracy. Like that seems pretty messed up. Like, oh, you care about democracy? You better register for this party. Like but, that- I mean, it's, I don't know, because it's not, it's not a difficult thing to do that, right? I mean, and you have uh, instances, I know at least of Republicans doing this in Texas of like, they'll register for one party in the primary basically so they can vote for the most left toward Democrat. And then of course, they'll just vote for the Republican in the general election. I mean, I guess, I guess I, I do concede your point. It's a, it's a gateway in a sense, but I don't think it's a very high bar for, for most people to, to hop over. But, uh, but Kevin, I, I want to zoom the conversation out just, just a little bit and get back to this, this theme of moderates, because I think sort of the issue with partisanship that you identified, that hasn't just happened in Oregon, right? Like that's happened all over the country. Whether you can say, some people may say that sort of started during the Iraq war. Some people could say that sort of started during the Tea Party movement. I personally think it, it really started when everyone got access to their smartphones. Uh, and from my sort of experience working in politics at the national level and really diving into some of this data is when basically when the iPhone first came out, it's crazy to look at this stuff. Like people should, should Google this. When the iPhone first came out and you basically see sort of adaption of it go up, like you just see the partisanship basically shifting continuously over the years. And 
people thought basically that, oh, well, I have this iPhone now, I have the internet, I can find any different opinion that I want online, right? Like I can go and look up, okay, well, Ben's a smart democratic guy. I don't know that much about politics, but you know, let me find out what the progressives are thinking and let me find out what the conservatives are thinking. But really what's been done is that people are sort of just going into their own little echo chambers. And that's basically helped sort of create the, the, the partisan uh, divide on the, on the national level, which of course has gone on to the local and, and the state level too. So I'm, I'm curious in a way, and I don't want this to sound too lame, but do you think in a way, Kevin, like what is the role of social media and technology and all this in terms of, you know, like wh- why are we so partisan at this point? It's not just happening in Oregon, it's happening in California, it's happening in Texas, it's happening in Florida. Uh, what's kind of your analysis of what's going on? Yeah, thanks for teeing that up. I think full disclosure, I have worked for Google. I've also worked for another Alphabet company and a couple Silicon Valley startups. So I'm familiar with the problem. We better just stop the recording right now. Ben. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I, I should just turn everything in. The big tech shill. <laughs> you know, so I, I think the internet age or whatever you want to call it, the promise of it in terms of connectivity, in terms of sharing ideas, sharing information is huge. And when you look at what it's done in terms of just, uh, so this may sound like Google propaganda, but one of the videos they show you right when you start is they show someone in, uh, I think it's Mali in Africa, and this person taught themselves how to throw a javelin from watching YouTube videos and made it to the Olympics. So your mind is just kind of blown of, wow, the, that, power, <laughs> the, the power of information, look at all this good. And so obviously there's that side of the story which they're going to tell Googlers. And then there's- Sorry, I, I'm still just perplexed by this video actually existing. I, I'm definitely going to have to go look at <laughs> this. All right, out. all right, check it out. <laughs> put it, and then put it in the show notes. Uh, <laughs> so on the flip side though, I think social media is a huge part of this. One of the, I won't call it funny, but one of the sad, to be honest, things about the Oregon way and some of the things we put on Facebook is how immediately- the response is either far left or far right with no sense of evaluation of the text of the post. People don't engage with the text. They see a headline, they see an author, and they've reached their opinion about it. And that's about the extent of the investigation. So what's hard is how do you get people willing to engage with even long form journalism, right? Oregon Way posts tend to be over 800 words. Right. Not a lot of people are willing to take the time or maybe have the time to read that length of a post. And so that's what I think we need to get back to. And hopefully once we're able to have in-person gatherings again, I'm really excited about having an Oregon Way convention, getting our contributors together, getting people from across the aisle leaving their phone at the door, maybe. I don't know, but I agree. If you look at what our phones have done to our attention span, to our willingness to even talk with people and to our ability to just grapple with anything longer than a paragraph, like clearly we need to upend what that's doing to our brain. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I worry if the solution to polarization and tribalism requires altering human behavior we're in trouble (laughs) that's my first fear is like we're not going to overcome the smartphone the smartphone is going to win no matter what and we need to adapt our systems and maybe our education system to to interface with it on the big tech topic big tech side one of the things that was interesting from our conversation with alec was that right out of the gate when i when basically the question was like how you doing almost immediately it, it eventually came around to the fact that big tech was censoring the right. Um, they pulled like, right. Like they pulled president Trump off of all channels and have eliminated his ability to interact there, which I, of course, as someone who witnessed an insurrection, uh, didn't have a problem with, but Alec made it, made a case for why he believes that the, the censorship is actually partisan or ideological. And so it kind of, that kind of gets to the root of the question is like, do you think that big tech should have the power and responsibility to choose who does and doesn't have a platform or is there a better way to do this? So I don't think I'm gonna be able to solve this 
question or answer this question in whatever time we have left. I think the fascinating thing that I had pointed out to me from a friend on the right was we just cut Trump off of Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. This is my... Hosts- this is exactly what Alex said. Exactly what Alex said. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, it, it's a. I don't. It must be making its way around the right. But can either of you give me a principled reason why Trump should be off Twitter and the Ayatollah Khomeini shouldn't? No, no, and I mean, I mean, you could obviously say too if the Ayatollah was just kind of you know hanging out on Twitter, not really doing too much tweeting, but he's there. It's like okay, well, he's not doing anything. But I mean, yeah, at least from. My understanding, he's called for the destruction of Israel and violence against Jews on, on Twitter. On Twitter, yeah, on multiple occasions. And I mean, I, I don't want to get too much into Iranian politics or anything like that, but I mean, <laughs> that, that, like those are terrible things, right? I mean, he's literally calling for mass genocide, basically. And you know, there's not removing from him on Twitter. And that's one area where I really, I, I'm a little bit like, I, I think that there needs to be some regulation on big tech. I don't know exactly what that looks like as a conservative. I'm still kind of looking into that, but. One thing, though, I do think is ridiculous is, and you hit on this a little bit earlier, Kevin, is like, I've seen so many media articles now of, oh, well, this guy who is Twitter bio says he's part of Proud Boys. He says we need to kill Joe Biden. And that'll become a big Washington Post article. Obviously, that's horrible. No one should threaten to kill anybody. I mean, that's that's not what we do as Americans. But on the reverse end, I see a lot of conservatives getting upset because they're saying, wait, I mean, we've had people in Antifa threatened to kill Andy Go, the Portland journalist, multiple times, and Twitter hasn't done anything about them. So is there an unfair standard there? I think there definitely is, right? No one should be able to call for the death of anyone, basically, over these platforms, if that's going to be the standard. If the standard is anything goes, it should be anything goes. If the standard is you say you're going to kill someone, you get kicked off, then you, then that's basically what you should do. You should get kicked off. This so is- that's where I, I think a lot of people on the right do really have something, uh, you know, th- I think that that is basically the right point. What's insane to me is this is the most obvious example of a case for a big, robust government. Like the government, we as a society should use our government to decide what the rules are. And it shouldn't be up to a for-profit company to decide. Like they were right to pull Trump for sure. Um, in my opinion, like it is obvious that he was using his platform to try to undermine our democracy and obvious, not just to Democrats, but some Republicans too. But it also doesn't surprise me that they fail to act in instances where they should have um, because it wasn't in their best interest. In this, in this instance, they were in a bright, bright white spotlight. Everyone was watching and making demands of them. When a random person on the right is getting death threats or even a random person on the left is getting death threats, you know, they've got their own bureaucracies to navigate and they don't care very much, I would imagine. So like use the government to regulate what is what is allowed on all social media, not just Twitter, draw a line in the sand of threats of violence and then just institute. Like, I don't get why that's so hard. Well, um, and just to, I think this raises a really important side point about the role of the government in media right now, which like Alex, I don't know if I'm, I haven't come up with a perfect formula for section 230 about the obligations of what kind of content moderation there needs to be. I do think there should be clear standards that are applied across the board. But more importantly, I think from a media standpoint, we need to really invest in local journalism. If we could have a Biden stimulus plan that said, I'm going to make sure these little tiny papers can actually get up and going again, I think that's a huge step forward in just giving people that local content, right? And it can be something that's on your smartphone. You can still do as much scrolling as you want, right? To get to your point, Ben, of, well, if a solution is without a smartphone, is it really a solution? But if we can have other places of journalism, other content to go to, to expand ideas and tie it more to the local community, I think that's a step forward rather than everyone feeling like the only place they can go are these platforms that are gonna automatically drive you to if not Trump, then Trump's son, right? Or if not Nancy Pelosi, then Nancy Pelosi's daughter. (laughs) Right. No, I think the local news point is a good one. Like I've been toying with the idea of trying to get into the local news space for a while because I think it is such, it is a market that is so available for whether you call it disruption or new entries, needs are, information needs are not being met in local communities. And I think it's a huge problem I think the issue there is structural, right? Like, how do you build local, like local news is dying. I think that's a pretty, in, 
I should caveat that. Most traditional old school local media outlets are dying. There are some instances like the Texas Tribune or like the Charlotte Observer who are doing things very differently and have shifted their business model in a way that's allowed them to grow really quickly. So when you look at the Oregon local news landscape, like what do you see? Um, is there promise or is it a desert or, and is that part of, I don't, I, I see the Oregon way as almost like an opinion page and less of a, a local news source, but like, how, how do you see the Oregon media landscape? So I, I think there's huge deserts. I mean, I, I agree that in its current iteration, the Oregon way is much more kind of a thought spot rather than, hey, are we keeping this little city council not little, but small town city council Check. accountable, yeah. right? I mean, I have a friend, a contributor to the Oregon Way, Rory, who's the youngest city councilor in West Lynn. And I read, about, I read about this guy. There was some crazy stuff going on about folks who weren't giving up their seats and they were trying to keep West Lynn city councilors from entering their seats and all this turmoil. I get onto Oregon Live and I see the top 10 listings in the West Hills that I can look at to buy. And I'm like, this is not journalism. This is clickbait. And so if our biggest paper and our source for most news, especially in the Willamette Valley, Portland area, is either Oregon Live or the Portland Tribune does an okay job, I, I just think there's a lot of room for improvement in bringing new voices in particular into local journalism. And also adding that element of keeping small, uh, keeping officials accountable. And make, so I want to ask about that because that's the way it used to be, right? Like 30 years ago, we had a very robust local media landscape where there was like lots of different papers. Like, you know, even when, when we were in high school, Oregon Live was doing, I don't think they're Oregon Live at the time, but the Oregonian had reporters doing Tiger Twalt and school board stuff. Um, but you also had the Tiger Times. And like, there was, there's was actually like competition from full-time professional reporters um, reporting on these things, but that died, that went away and largely, um, well, we could talk about why, but I'm it's curious. Big tech. Is that your thesis? Big tech? Oh, killed, for killed. sure. Yeah. No, they, they took all the ads, all the ad money moved to digital platforms. Well, then doesn't that just mean that they should adapt a better business model? Oh, for sure. But it, it, I mean, the, the issue is though, that you're always going to get more eyes on a site like Facebook than the Tiger Times. Right. And so if I'm an advertiser, I don't want to waste any of my money on right. the Tiger Times. The people who are the people who have figured this out, in my opinion, are no longer an advertising right. revenue model for local news. They're subscription model where if you if the, if, if the information is valuable to you, you pay for it. Right. Um, and I think like if I think a lot of institutions could have saved themselves by making a, a painful but a, a quick and painful pivot to a subscription revenue model rather than clinging to this idea that like with clicks or print advertisements, we're gonna be able to weather this storm while Google and Facebook were just like coming in full speed. And this is where I think adding that element of government support or foundations is so critical, right? Because it shouldn't Why? just be the folks who are able to pay for that subscription that get access to high quality local news. Arguably so the folks who most need that news are struggling to find high quality information journalism because of paywalls and things so like that. This is, I did not expect us to be talking about this, but I'm super into this. So aren't there major issues with the government funding news? And if so, like, to me, I, this is something I've thought about, talked about. I think I'm of the place now where I think government paying for news has too many challenges to overcome for that being worthwhile. Foundations make sense for sure, in my opinion, um, to basically what you're talking about is subsidizing access to local news through a subscription model. But do you, do you think that government funding is viable and worthwhile? So every time I read OPB, I'm getting pretty good news. I, I don't think a lot of folks would necessarily look at OPB on, I'd say across the political spectrum and say, this news sucks or is like low quality. If we had better OPB or little branches of OPB oh, across what? Oregon. Okay, so, so you wouldn't support government. So what I'm thinking of is like, let's say that you get government funding and it goes to like the newspaper in Roseburg and they publish an editorial that says like, Donald Trump is the president. You know what I mean? Or so like, I don't know, you can insert crazy idea here and maybe it's not Roseburg, maybe it's somewhere else, but 
OPB doesn't take stances. They don't have an editorial page. So I'm curious, like, I don't, Titus, what do you think? Like, like I, I can imagine the conservative perspective being the most opposed to this, right? Like you're subsidizing media, you're subsidizing big media. How would you view government subsidy to like save local news? Well, it's, it's funny and I hope someone will fact check me on this, but if I'm not mistaken, uh, a certain Michael Pence, when he was governor of <laughs> Indiana, actually set up uh, or was planning to set up like some sort of basically news news uh, distribution service that was funded by the government. Of course, that got attacked instantly from folks on the left and, and Democrats saying, this is going to be the Mike Pence propaganda outfit. For sure. Uh, we're going to hear about all these crazy positions. You know, there's going to be this reporting on abortion or, or, or whatever. So I, I don't even buy necessarily the argument that you know, that just conservatives would be against something like this because it's spending government funds on something on something like journalism. Uh, I don't I don't even necessarily buy that point because you could totally see that if Dennis Richardson was governor or something like that, I'm sure a lot of Democrats would be potentially concerned if he was making investments in, in publications that maybe were trying to report favorably towards him or something like that. So I think you're always going to come to that sort of crossroads no matter where you're at in terms of, uh, you know, if you're if you're a Democrat or a Republican. I think the government funding, or at least providing grants to something like that, or increasing funding of things like OPB would be interesting. Uh, where I'm a little bit more skeptical and more opposed, I think, is things like the big foundations looking into some of this stuff. Uh, really? I still think that the smartest thing that Jeff Bezos ever did was buy the Washington Post, because uh, he's basically able to use that now as a platform to defend Amazon, basically, no matter what, or take some of the best reporters in the country, you know, and basically tone them down a little bit. Let's even say if they're, you know, writing about Amazon. Let's take that for the Portland example, right? We have Phil Knight. What's he worth? Probably $20 billion at this point, founder of Nike. He's a conservative guy, right? Let's say Phil Knight started funding all of these publications that basically were not looking into some of the stuff that Nike's doing, you know, in terms of their factories in China. They're, they refuse to explore maybe some of the local business corruption issues because, you know, some of those tax breaks or whatever are basically benefiting his company. Uh, that's what I'm a little bit more skeptical of, like, these foundations, which are basically sort of the private investment arms of, of some major wealthy people. Uh, but I do think it'd be interesting to consider, and something you could probably find bar bipartisan support from, to increase funding for things like OPB, uh, especially if they'd actually go out more into the local communities and sort of expand the workforce that way. Yeah, I mean, I think right now, especially the economic climate we're in, supporting folks, uh, there, I forget the name of the program, but there's basically a teach for America for journalists mm -hmm. of, hey, we're going to go send you to this cash-strapped paper so that you can go attend that city council meeting for them and take minutes and then report out. And I think that's the kind of support I envision. Obviously, getting into the nitty gritty of the details of how this would actually look is like 15 podcast episodes. <laughs> I think we're starting at such a low level, right? Of just the number of papers that are just spewing national stories and taking AP stories and putting them in, like that cut and paste model is always going to lose out to that great Facebook post from your aunt or your uncle, that's way more attention grabbing. But if you could ground news, even if it's not the best news, even if it's skewed a little bit left or a little bit right, I would much rather have that than having people permanently scrolling social media and having nowhere to go for local news. No, I think that I think that's right. I think the, the problem again is the sustainability side. So like, the argument against TFA is like you pay for a teacher to teach there for two years and then they, and you, A, you don't train them, but B, they teach there for two years and then they leave. Like whether you agree or disagree with the, the critique, like that thinking applies here. Unless you, unless you have a funding source that is sustainable and reliable and not subject to like political whims, like, I don't know, Titus, about this whole bipartisan support for expansion of state funded media from the right. Like there've been, there's a long history of folks on the right trying to cut OP. Like, do you remember the Big Bird thing when Mitt Romney ran against Obama? How like, oh yeah, <laughs> like like this is, it's, like, it's like classic. Like Alex Carlotos for sure would not. I I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure it would not support an expansion of state funded media. And so the risk is if you go that route and you secure funding, and then Alec becomes Speaker of the House or his candidate becomes Speaker of the House and controls the purse strings, like 
you're you 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 just you can instantly create news deserts again who've relied just like they relied on advertising as a source of funding now they're relying on this other form which maybe speaks to the broader point here which is like a diverse range of funding sources is necessary and it can be like advertising subscription foundations event based like that's what that's the lesson from the texas tribune is like look at how they're securing funding it's from a bunch of different things um not a single source but anyway we we are up up against the wall here for time um so uh first i just want to say thank you to kevin and, and titus do you want to lead us to the closing question Yes, Kevin, and th thanks again so much for for coming on the podcast. Uh, so, Kevin, for people who want to uh, follow you, you know, learn more about what you're doing at the Oregon Way, potentially read some of the articles there. Uh, where do they go to find all of that stuff? Awesome. Yeah, you can hit me up on Twitter at at Kevin T Frazier, and Frazier's F R A Z I E R, not like the TV show. Uh, and you can follow the Oregon Way on Substack or on Twitter at uh, the underscore Oregon underscore way. So check it out. Welcome folks who are listening to this to consider becoming contributors. You get to work with me. I make your life pretty easy and you get to help shape the future of Oregon. And uh, thanks to the two of you for letting me chat. Absolutely. It's been our, ple our pleasure. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs>